About four years ago, I made a video sharing my experience running a small print farm. I covered what worked, what didn't, and the things I wish I'd known when I started out. The feedback in that video has been largely positive, and while a lot of the information in it still holds true today, the reality is that it's been almost 10 years since I was printing and selling parts. In that time, and even in the shorter time since making that video, a lot has changed in the 3D printing space. In a recent episode I did with Joel from Polymaker for their Meet the Polymaker segment, the print farm came up, and I've been wanting to revisit it ever since. In this video, we'll dive into 3D print farms, cover the main changes I've seen, and what I would do if I were to fire it back up today. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Before diving in, I want to quickly clarify on what I mean when I say 3D print farm. When some people picture a print farm, they might think of multiple racks of printers all over the place. But to me, if you have two or more printers that you're actively using to print and sell products, that's a print farm. Or perhaps a print garden, as someone called it in my previous video. Scaling up printers is really the easy part, so don't get discouraged or feel like you can't get started just because you don't have enough machines. The biggest change since I last ran a shop is the massive jump forward in both printer quality and usability. While I still wouldn't quite describe 3D printing as plug and play, getting up and running fairly reliably with current machines is a night and day difference compared to what was available even just five years ago. To give you an idea of what I was using, it was a combination of the Fulgurtech 2020, the Monoprice Select Mini, the Anet A8, and the last one I added was the original Ender 3. These were all bed slingers with manual bed leveling by default, acceleration set to around 500, and standard flow hot ends. There was no input shaping, no auxiliary fans to help with additional cooling, and for the most part, if you wanted to print with anything above PTG, you had to come up with sort of a DIY enclosure solution. This meant that printing anything took much longer, and it also required a deeper knowledge of both hardware and slicers to get reliable, consistent prints. The only positive of this from a seller standpoint was that there was far less competition. Fewer people wanted to put in the effort to really dive into these machines, so there were less people offering print services and less people printing parts. Fast forward to today and printers swim laps around what I was using. Even machines under $300 can print four times faster than the printers I was using back then without much of a hit to the print quality. And the amount of tinkering required has dropped to where in many cases it's completely optional while Back then, you really had to tinker and upgrade and mod things to get any hope of having some sort of reliability and repeatability. Because of that, there are way more print farms and sellers on the platforms I was using, which were eBay, Etsy, and Amazon. And even my local market here in Idaho has a couple of booths that strictly sell 3D printed parts. Even with this being the case, with careful planning and doing a few things to set yourself apart, there are still tons of opportunities out there. There's three main things that I can think of that you can use to help set yourself apart from the rest. The first is to niche down. The beautiful thing about 3D printing is that, for the most part, the sky is the limit as far as the different things that you can make. However, when I look around at a large amount of the shops, they're selling fairly similar things, with a lot of them being popular toys and trinkets that sort of come in different seasons. Back when I was running my shop, it was the fidget spinner craze, and while I did make and sell a ton of those fidget spinners, it was incredibly short-lived once they became mass-produced and it was sort of erased at the bottom, and it never would have been something that would have been sustainable long-term for my shop to lean on. Since then, there has been plenty of others, with the one that most here will be familiar with being the Flexi Dragons. I love a good Flexi Dragon as much as the next person, but with everybody printing and selling them, the marketplace has gotten really, really saturated. To this day, I still see them for sale online and at my local market, but the prices have really come down on them, and it's another just example of one of those things where everyone got super excited about it, jumped on that bandwagon until it just sort of fizzled out. Instead of following trends, my recommendation is to find a niche that can benefit from 3D printing. 
It really helps if it's a hobby or area that you have some expertise in because you'll have a much easier time finding pain points, gaps in current offerings, and just 3D printed accessories that others can benefit from within that niche. A few items I sold that did really well were replacement parts for products that were beyond their end of life or ones where the manufacturer didn't didn't provide those parts outside of the initial warranty period. Simple gears, clip mechanisms, and a handful of mounts were a few of those examples. Even back then, 3D printing the part was really the easiest part of the whole thing, and what most of my time went into was just doing market research, trying to find different niches and find items that I felt could be useful, that would be useful enough that someone would be willing to pay for it. Then I would print a couple of them, take some photos, create the listing, and see how it performed after 30 days and after 90 days. For the really popular items, I kept a small inventory, but for everything else, I just gave myself enough of handling time so that way I could print them on demand. The next way to stand out is by printing in different materials. Almost everyone was printing in PLA when I ran my shop, and while I printed and sold plenty of things in PLA, there were a handful of things that I sold that were printed in ABS. I took a survey or a poll on the channel a little over a week ago where I asked what filaments do you print with or feel comfortable printing with, and ended up getting over 2,000 replies. While this data is somewhat skewed, assuming that those that are watching this channel are at least a little bit more involved in 3D printing than someone just starting out, and the poll only let me have four different options, I still feel like it proves a point. The results showed that roughly 50% feel comfortable printing with PLA, PETG, and TPU, and the other 50% with those three materials as well as ABS and ASA. There were 83 comments that listed additional materials such as PCTG, PPS, PETCF, and a few others, but this was a much smaller portion of those that voted in the polls. I was a little bit surprised to see how many people were printing with ABS and ASA, but given that more and more printers are coming fully enclosed, some of them even having chamber heaters and things like the Voron projects where it's really centered around ABS or ASA, I, I guess it makes sense. With approximately half printing with PLA, PTG, and TPU, it does go to show that if you can find a part or parts that make sense to print in a higher temp or specialty material, that is a way that you can set yourself apart. The final thing you can do, which is really a big one, is to familiarize yourself with CAD and 3D modeling. I'd planned on doing a follow-up poll to the 3D printing material one just to see how many people are actually 3D modeling, but if I had to take a wild guess, I would say that it is much less than 50%. This is something I need to spend more time doing myself as a lot of the CAD work I'm doing right now is just taking an existing 3D model, doing some modifications to it for my specific use case, but there has never been a better time than right now. There are more CAD packages or 3D modeling options than ever before, and tons of videos and articles on just about all of them to teach you really everything you would need to know. There's plenty of existing models out there that are licensed in a way where you're able to print and sell them, and tons of artists out there that have paid models where you can pay for a specific tier and have the ability to then print and sell their models, and that's great, a lot of people do do that, but this is always going to be much more limiting than learning how to do the 3D modeling yourself so you can make unique custom parts. What's going to be best is going to largely depend on the specific niche and type of things that you want to cover. For organic modeling, that is probably always going to be something that I find an existing model to then print or find an artist that does really incredible organic modeling and use their models. But for a lot of what I was doing, which was the functional a lot of functional parts, the 3D modeling side of it was relatively simple in most cases. Most of my time was spent taking my digital calipers and grabbing a bunch of different measurements that I would then uh, use for my base sketch and extrude it into a 3D object. Oftentimes these were relatively straightforward and with the tools built into a lot of the slicers now, you can further customize your models even after they've been exported into an STL or 3MF file. My goal with this video is to hopefully encourage anyone that's been sort of kicking the can on printing and selling items or, you know, has been wanting to set up some kind of a print farm, and for those that are maybe feeling discouraged thinking that they just have missed the boat. While the market has rapidly evolved over the years and this space has really grown, there is still plenty of potential out there and possibilities for anyone willing to put in the time. 
Even for those that long term aren't interested in running a print farm or selling products, it's a really great way to recoup the cost of a fancy machine purchase, even if the end goal is just to have that machine for personal use. With the rise of multi-color or multi-material machines, there is a whole new world of possibilities of things that you can now print and make that just weren't feasible or even possible through things like manual filament swapping. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that it gave you some things to think about. For anyone that is currently running a print farm or printing and selling items, I would love to hear if you have any other tips or recommendations on things that you just wish you had known when you started out. If you have any additional questions, as always, let me know in the comments and I will do my best to answer. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video just about every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. If you wanted to support the channel further, I'll have links in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys!